Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're located. Welcome to the December version of Berlin Talks, the December installment of a discussion series involving a panel of experts commenting on current events. Uh, we are going to have a discussion tonight about migration and its intersection with the pandemic crisis of this year in particular. Um, on behalf of Freie Universität Berlin, I welcome our panelists and I welcome also you, the audience, uh, who have joined us here. Uh, you will be able to submit comments and questions through the chat function. The event is being recorded. Um, but your identity as audience member will not be part of that. So that will be unknown. You will be anonymous as member of the audience. Uh, although you can again submit uh, questions and, and comments. So in the course of the event, you don't have to wait till the very end. The Berlin Talks project is a project of two programs at Freie Universität Berlin. The FU Best program, uh, Berlin European Studies. It's a semester-based program for international students uh, involving subject courses mostly taught in English and German language instruction. And also by the FUBIS program, the Freie Universität Berlin International Summer and Winter University, which offers three weeks in January and two terms during the summer months. Uh, as you might imagine, both programs also are very active in an online sense uh, at this point, because we normally would have students here on site, and we hope, of course, to have so uh, to be able to do so again soon. Uh, but at this moment, uh, we offer many things online. If you go to our websites, fubest.org and fubis.org, uh, you will find more information about our various online offerings. So tonight we are going to have uh, a discussion about migration and about the pandemic. And uh, as it will become clear with this issue, uh, as the old saying goes, where you stand very much depends on where you sit. That is, we will have people present different perspectives because they come at this issue from a different angle. Um, we are hoping still to be joined by Nikolaus von Peter, uh, whom I will then introduce later. He will be representing the European Union Commission, uh, and he is scheduled to join us. So we'll await his arrival, so to speak, in this event. Um, and then we have a German broader national perspective of the issue, a local Berlin perspective, and a perspective focused on the media, because they, after all, play a crucial role in terms of where people get their information. So let me introduce the panelists that are already there tonight. Ah, I see that uh, Herr von Peter has joined us. Uh, good evening as well. So let me uh, introduce for our audience uh, the four panelists. Uh, professor Margaret Lunenborg is Professor of Journalism at the Institute for Media and Communication Studies at Freie Universität Berlin. After almost 10 years as a journalist for print media and public broadcasting, she entered the academic world to combine professional knowledge and its analytical reflection. Her current research focuses on the transformation of journalism inequalities in media representation and media and migration. She's leading a research project on journalism and its order of emotions within the collaborative research center, Affective Societies. Here she is interested in how media reporting on migration, especially also forced migration, in current hybrid media context produces fear, anger, and outrage. Then for the local Berlin perspective, we are joined by Christiane Beckmann. She is CEO in the Citizens Association Moabit Hilft, Moabit Helps, a local initiative in one of the central sections of the city that seeks to assist refugees and asylum applicants in Berlin in a variety of ways. Christiane is often lovingly nicknamed Nane, Mama, by her colleagues at the center in Berlin's Turmstraße. She has been active in the social justice field for many years. 
In recent years, she organized support for those assisting victims of flood disasters, made sandwiches for the homeless, and has been helping at the refugee reception site in the Moabit section of Berlin since August 2015. Tireless, meticulous, with a love of detail in her struggle for justice, she is the contact point for everything that makes the bureaucratic jungle lighter or the asylum procedure more understandable. Doigo Gürsel is joining us uh, as one of our FUBEST faculty members. She teaches a course on migration in the FUBEST program. She holds a master's degree from the German-Turkish master's program in social sciences jointly offered by Humboldt University uh, in Berlin and the Middle East Technical University. She's currently completing her dissertation, her doctoral dissertation at Humboldt University in the field of sociology. And in this project, she focuses on the transformation of the character of migrant labor from factory worker into self-employed in West Berlin. Uh, she has taught at a number of institutions of higher education and, as I said, is also an instructor in the FUBEST program. Nikolaus von Peter is a jurist and civil servant in the European Union. Currently, he's a member of the political team at the representation of the European Commission in Germany, office located here in, in Berlin. In this team, he carries responsibility for several policy areas, including migration, internal security, digitalization, justice, and competition policy. Before assuming this post in Berlin, he worked in Brussels in the cabinet of the EU Transportation Commissioner and in several other EU directorates general, and before that in the German Federal Civil Service. Welcome again to our four panelists. So tonight we are addressing the question of migration intersecting with the crisis of the pandemic. We're going to do so in three steps. We are going to be looking at the legacy, so to speak, of 2015, when this enormous wave of refugees, mostly from North Africa and the Middle East, flooded into Europe uh, and its aftermath, of course. Then we will look at the dynamics of this crisis of migration combined with the crisis of the pandemic. And finally, we will speculate a little bit about an outlook, uh, how things might look in the months and perhaps years to come. We have to keep in mind tonight that migration is a very broad concept. It involves the movement of people and that can have many sources and factors and backgrounds. What we are going to be particularly focused on tonight is instances of forced migration, people leaving their homeland or their home territory, their home town, etc., uh, because of circumstances that they can't control that they're trying to get away from. Those are also very uh, different in, in kind. Uh, conflict, we'll see tonight, is an obvious reason why people might flee, but it can also be natural disasters. It can be economic deprivation, simply looking for another place where one can make a living. Persecution, of course, is also another factor, for example, religious persecution. So key terms that will come up tonight are the terms migration, refugee, asylum, exile, displacement. We need to keep in mind also that those that are displaced very often are not that far away from their actual place of, of home. Uh, that is, if you take, for example, the Syrian conflict, many of the Syrian refugees are still in the Middle East or near Syria, and perhaps even in other parts of the country. I want to show you as a starter, before we get to our discussion, a number of images uh, and some statistics, because it may be necessary for us all and for you also as audience to be reminded of some of the aspects of things that happened from 2015 and on. We start with a few pictures um, that we will quickly review that will show you the kinds of things that we were seeing in the news in 2015. Uh, that seems a long time ago now because of everything that has happened since then. Um, but these were everyday images. And of course, this sad image of the drowned boy on the beach was one that in many ways transformed a lot of discussion or seemed to. 
The reaction to this wave of uh, refugees was one of either welcoming and holding together, you can see here some examples of that, but also responses of rejection, of protest against letting people in, um, populist reactions, um, trying to block the refugees from being received. Here you see um, a map of Europe uh, for the European migrant crisis in 2015. You can see the large arrows showing two major paths through which refugees came into Europe. One, the Eastern Mediterranean involving Turkey, involving the Balkans, and the other one involving North Africa coming to Italy, where of course some of the scenes with the, the boats and particularly uh, those that drowned were the ones that uh, really dominated much of the, the coverage in the news. Here you see an overview of asylum claims in the year 2015, simply to point to the countries that were particularly on the receiving end of uh, asylum applicants. Uh, Germany, which of course is a focus in our discussion tonight, um, Hungary, Sweden, uh, France and Italy also, but you see different countries having different quantity of uh, applicants coming in. Here you see migrant numbers and what is striking here as well, if you look at this uh, picture, at this depiction, is the drop-off overall from 2015 to 2018, uh, with the exception of the Western Mediter Mediterranean route, where you see a dramatic increase uh, from 2015 to 2018. But in other cases, you see uh, a great drop-off, um, and we will get at the question as to how this was uh, caused uh, to happen, uh, what policies were put in place, restrictions, et cetera, uh, at, at border areas. Again, much of the discussion also focused on those that perished on the way, trying to flee conflict, trying to flee hardship and, and come into uh, Europe. Uh, and you see the, the high level of dead and missing uh, for 2015, 2016. And as the numbers declined in terms of people trying to get into Europe, these numbers also declined, but every single one, of course, was one too many. Successful asylum applications from 2014 to 17. I simply want to show this to you to point out that Germany did receive a very high proportion of these applications followed by France, Italy, Austria, and Sweden. Or to put it this way, if you look at it here, uh, I wanted to show you this particular one because we will be looking at the local Berlin scene. Here you can see that uh, in terms of end of 2017, um, asylum seekers coming in, uh, about 83,000 of them ended up in Berlin alone. And so we will be looking at the local scene here as an example of a grassroots coping with this, with this issue. Now, what's interesting also is to take a little longer time perspective, because if you look back uh, in terms of Germany with asylum claims, then what you see is that there was a previous episode with a very high number of asylum claims, and that was the early 90s because of the Balkans conflict. That is sometimes forgotten when the focus is just on the year 2015, uh, but Germany has seen several waves uh, of, of this refugee question uh, in recent decades, and, and one that stands out is the early 90s in the Balkans conflict. What's also interesting to look at is the sex and age pyramid of asylum seekers in the case of 2015. And what you see there is that there is a very high percentage uh, of asylum seekers that are male rather than female. And also that the age pyramid shows that it's particularly those in middle age brackets, uh, not so much the elderly and not so much in large numbers, the younger ones, but uh, clustering especially between 18 and, say, 40 or so. And then we have uh, a quick view here of a public response that was picked up in an opinion poll in March of 2020. Um, of course, the uh, pandemic was just starting, so uh, that was not really mixed in the response yet, probably. But you see the dramatic contrast, uh, particularly between the Green Party on one side and the alternative for Germany on the uh, far right side of the political spectrum on the other side, in terms of acceptance versus rejection 
of refugees. And then uh, one more picture here uh, showing German cities, again, simply to lift out of the picture the situation in Berlin, where you see that Berlin, with a city of some three and a half plus million people, uh, has uh, at least uh, as of 2016, these figures are from that year, uh, between 500,000 and 1 million uh, people who have a migration background or descendant population. And that, again, is a much broader category than just refugees or those applying for asylum. So these are the pictures that we wanted to show you simply as a, a starter. Um, and I'd like to have the discussion start on the broader European level uh, and turn to Mr. Van Peta uh, first. Uh, we want to start today with the historical background of 2015 and the years yes. after that. Yes. We, we'd like to hear from you, since you can offer us a European Union perspective, a view of this issue as the flood of refugees appeared on Europe's doorsteps. Now looking back, how did the EU try to cope with this? What worked, what didn't work, what were the problems? Was there a tendency for countries to go the national route rather than to come up with a European solution? What was a European sol solution supposed to look like at that time? How did that transpire from 2015 until the point we get to the pandemic? Maybe you can give us a bit of a sense from a European Union point of view. Yes. Um, it's a long story. And I, 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 I have to put the focus on something, um, and I may miss out important, uh, important points, because all uh, perspective matters, and perspective on this particular story uh, of European integration is, is very is a very different one depending on who is telling the story. Um, I think if you, if you look at it from the perspective of the member states who uh, had to, um, who witnessed, who felt uh, a, a, a stark increase of, um, of arrivals, of people coming to the shores of Europe. Um, they would tell you a story of, of, uh, of, uh, of, of, uh, of being completely out of control, uh, of not being able to cope with this situation. Already before, did they, uh, did they mismanage uh, or weren't they able to to manage uh, arrivals very well, people come uh, into their uh, country, uh, and and uh, but uh, but well enough. But uh, in 2015, as you said, uh, uh, perhaps I wouldn't talk about a flood, but uh, about many many people that uh, effectively arrived at, and very suddenly. That was the big the big difference to the years before. Um, they, they had no no capacities in place, and they're still grappling. Uh, to 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 deal with what it, it is not the same, same situation in terms of arrivals, but in terms of people who have uh, who have not found a place yet in Europe, not returned yet. Um, that that that's a situation which we must understand that the arrivals uh, have gone down dramatically. So there is no longer uh, it's not longer justified to talk of something like a crisis, but the situation for these countries. Uh, is is pretty much the same because uh, the overall number of people in these countries is still very high, and and only uh, only by now has the Greek Greek uh, um, Greek government, for instance, uh, um, uh, come to grips with the with the numbers. Uh, also, thanks to um, to a lot of support from the European Asylum uh, Agency, we have nine hundred almost nine hundred people uh, from uh, European countries uh, um, recruited by that agency, EASO. On, on, on Greek soil, and 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 in fact, the backlog in asylum applications has uh, has been cleared almost completely. But so we're now at a point where we can see for the first time uh, uh, a moment, or we have some some sort of of of, of relief uh, uh, where we can, uh, which is a good moment to to discuss the the asylum package, which is now on the table, the migration asylum package, but. Um, this is only one perspective, and I have to say that uh, these member states, uh, and this is not only Greece, it's also Italy, and it's a different story, Malta, they have more in common because they are, and they have been very often the dest destination of, 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 of ships 
uh, of, of uh, search and rescue um, uh, vessels. Uh, and, and, and very often did they have to respond to these, um, uh, uh, to these vessels at the short notice. Um, and and um, that's a, a, different, a different situation, a situation that Greece faced, which is more of a constant in, income and constant flow, uh, which is linked to the different migration routes people are coming. So um, some of the member states have received a lot of support. Greece alone has received more than 2 billion euros, 2 million euros in the last um, uh, five years. Uh, other member states a bit less, but constant support from the European Union uh, in order to improve their capacities and support from member states. Uh, and there I'm thinking more of Italy and Malta and others who have accommodated people rescued at sea and have then been helped to uh, find a new home for these people. And there, particularly German has played a, a role. Now, a completely different perspective is the one from a member state like Germany, because uh, if Italy and uh, and um, and Greece have been the member states of first entrance, as we say it, as as bureaucrats, and so the the place where people would actually first touch the European soil, many many people would actually straightly walk through these countries and try to get to only a few member states like Germany or Sweden. And these member states have a different interest than the member states at the um, at, at the border. Uh, there is this main issue of secondary migration, uh, which is this uh, what I've just described that uh, hardly anyone arrives at the European uh, at the German shore because there is no such shore any longer uh, in, in, a, in, in a Schengen area in an area with common external borders. But people always come from a member state where they already have been before, which then would formally be uh, responsible for the application, uh, asylum application. So um, many, many, many uh, people who came to Germany would actually have been uh, assigned under Dublin rules. So these are the rules responsible for assigning asylum applications or the procedures for uh, executing, uh, for, 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 uh, for treating applications would have been or should have been in a state in Italy and uh, in, in, in Greece, for instance. Now the, the, the interest of Germany uh, is now to to minimize the uh, secondary migration, and and this is so not not so much because of humanitarian reasons, but because and that's a general thing we must remember, and that's a very contentious issue because, as a matter of fact, under current rules, and these are mostly international European rules, mostly international rules, which define our responsibilities towards people in need, um, not even. Uh, not even a third of those arriving to Europe have a right to stay. And, and if you now extrapolate this to the numbers of people coming into Germany, many, many people in Germany would need to return. But return is very difficult once they're here uh, for, for different reasons. So the German government has now for the last years had one, uh, one petitum, one, uh, one, one important demand, which is to reduce secondary migration. That's an important uh, and this is something important to understand if we uh, during the discussion come to explain come to talk about uh, the commission proposal which we will put on the table in september and countries like germany have a very strong interest in uh, having other member states coming in and helping them with accommodating with taking on uh, a, a refugee um, so this is the famous discussion about solidarity so that in that, that case with uh, member states in the south. That's the, sec the, the second perspective. And the third perspective, uh, and then I will stop, is the one you also know very well uh, from the discussions over the last years, which is the perspective of those member states, which have a completely different story uh, when it comes to migration. Um, in Poland, for instance, not even 1% of, um, of the population has a migration background. So um, irrespective of the government, uh, which is uh, in charge of defining policies, um, people are not so uh, used to migration. And it's m easier than here, I guess, to make them, um, to, to make them uh, not understand, but to, uh, to tell them that migration is not for Poland. Although there is migration to Poland from Catholic countries, for instance, Philippines, for instance, um, which we don't notice so much. But when it comes to Syrian refugees and, 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 and the main groups, Afghanis, etc., the Polish government has been, and, and the Hungarian government, and the Czech government, and now more and more governments in Europe, 
have not been very forthcoming to say to to, to put it mildly and 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 uh, the big reform the commission proposed in 2016 to put more order into the european asylum system has failed has come to a halt because of one single question as you know which is the solidarity question um and and while the german government has been adamant to uh, to insist on uh, have, has been very strong in insisting on that solidarity on every member state having to to chip in to to take part to its fair share uh, the other group of member states has been uh, extremely uh, completely uh, opposed to this and not willing to move at all and that's why the first um, the first attempt to reform uh, has 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 almost has has, has failed. Uh, we had set, put seven laws on the table, and and five were probably practically agreed. Uh, but for two, and mainly for one, this law about a solidarity mechanism, uh, the, the 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 first reform after 2015 failed. And that's a bit the background to what we have now, which is the uh, the asylum immigration um, pact the package, which we put forward in September. And, and which is probably also uh, uh, an important topic to talk about today. I hope that this was uh, uh, a good uh, starting point because I, I think whatever we discussed today, uh, this evening, it's very important to understand that perspectives in Europe are very, very different. And that 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 is the reason why what the Commission is proposing now is a compromise. And and there's a lot of, of, of you have always an opportunity desire to think other other things would, would be better in theory and practice we have to look at realities how they are and we have to understand that European Union is a union of 27 member states where we are uh, well advised to try to foster uh, 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 an agreement that everyone can can support okay also in practice thank, thank you very much uh, we already see that within Europe there are so many different perspectives. I want to turn to Doigo Gürsel, uh, who focuses in her own research and her own views of the migration issue very much on what's happening in Germany. Um, Doigo, give us a sense of the German perspective or the perspective in Germany. Um, we see uh, in 2015, Angela Merkel, uh, she said, wir schaffen das, uh, we'll manage it somehow. Um, but then also the popular reaction, on the one hand, the celebration of what was called Willkommenskultur, a culture of welcoming people, but then also this backlash. Um, looking back on it now from 2020, again, not including the pandemic situation right now, but 2015 and its initial years as aftermath, what are your observations? Uh, hi, Dirk. Uh, thank you, first of all, for the invitation and organization of this event. And um, yeah, let's let's go uh, with your question now. It's, it's difficult, of course, now to <laughs> reply this huge question. In a short time, um, but maybe if we go back to the summer of 2015, also to uh, give an idea to the audience what happened in Germany, how was the first uh, reaction? I guess uh, Professor Lüneburg will also uh, maybe go into this uh, reactions, but I'm just going to uh, give a short uh, overview because the. Um, I want to focus first on the discursive level, how was the first reaction in the discursive level, and then the uh, policy level. Um, first of all, I mean, if we think about this, uh, the summer of 2015 as an event, it was a um, moment of open borders, and Dublin regulation was suspended by Germany. Um, uh, Nicolas already mentioned about the Dublin regulation, but just to make it made more clear, according to Dublin re regulation, the country responsible for the asylum application is the first country of entry to European Union, and these are the Southeast uh, European countries like Italy, Greece, Spain. And this was for a moment, uh, moment was uh, suspended in the summer of uh, 2015. And people are coming to Germany, and some on foot crossing the borders. And uh, there was an emerging um, culture of welcome in German becomes culture uh, in this period. Uh, it has also, a, a, uh, of course, a history uh, 
through the SAF organization of migrants and refugees, it just didn't appear at once. So but the term, this culture of welcome, it actually uh, originates from the utilitarian aspects of German migration politics. It emerged first um, in the face of the negative experiences with green card model. Germany tried to uh, recruit uh, high skilled IT workers and uh, this green card mo model didn't work out as they expected. Uh, not so many people wanted to come to Germany. So the German employers wanted to promote such a culture of welcome to attract migrant high skilled workers. But during the summer of 2015, this term uh, has transformed itself. It, um, it was coming from, uh, from the bottom, from uh, the local initiatives and civil society. And um, it, it was interesting to see that um, every major political party, trade union company, all kinds of associations, and um, the media uh, was joining to this uh, welcome campaign. Um, it was not something uh, happened before in Germany. So millions of Germans were going to the train stations, to shelters, to other places where uh, refugees were arriving. So even some volunteers from Southern Germany and Austria uh, went directly to Hungary or Croatia uh, to pick up refugees during this um, long summer of migration. So, um, to, uh, out of this uh, cultural welcome, many welcome initiatives emerged uh, through volunteers. Christiane will uh, talk about this, for instance. And then um, there has been a shift in this uh, welcoming campaigns, in welcoming uh, discourse uh, in the media coverage, I would say. It is, it is uh, disputable if also it, uh, if it affected the public opinion uh, um, um, yeah, so strongly. Um, it was the media coverage with the sexual assaults uh, by allegedly refugees in New Year's in uh, Cologne. The racist coverage of these news and debates has found resonance in right-wing groups and um, also in the right-wing political party, AFD, who were already formed before the long summer of migration. And these um, debates led also that, so that this, uh, this political party became uh, more strong. So if you look at um, to the debate on the migration and integration politics, we see there a very polarized debate. I mean, there have been especially two strong groups. One is um, pro-migration and the other is anti-migration I mean, attitude. And the pro-migration attitude has been dominated by um, neoliberal ideas of migration, taking the economic utility of migrants into focus. And the anti-migration group has been dominated by nationalistic ideas and racist ideas, seeing migration as a threat and um, who stand for uh, securitization of migration politics. So when we look at the policy level, what changed after 2015, we see that these both polarized debates found resonance in the policy making. So, I mean, there were like also policies, pro-migration policies and uh, anti-migration policies happening. Um, maybe first uh, the, the anti-migration anti politics uh, of this nationalist and right-wing agenda, how it has been realized. Um, uh, there has been changes in the asylum law. I mean, it has been further dismantled, so to say. It has been tightened, restricted. It was already um, started to get dismantled in 1993 as Dirk uh, showed uh, in this graphic uh, during the refugees coming uh, from the Balkan Wars. And, and it continued with this uh, dismantling of the asylum law. Um, some changes, um, there has been, for instance, limitation of family unification uh, of um, 
asylum seekers and um, safe countries of origin lists have been expanded um, Roma and Sinti from Balkan states uh, are now considered as coming from safe countries of origin or there has been an accelerated asylum procedure um, which doesn't mean necessarily positive uh, thing and um, there has been an orderly return law, these like legal measures to facilitate deportations by increasing detention. Um, and a new downgraded status, for instance, do light. It applies uh, to persons with unclarified identity. It criminalizes uh, in this way uh, uh, asylum seekers who uh, doesn't have the uh, uh, identity with themselves. And if you look at to the neoliberal uh, um, attitude and pro-migration supporters, uh, they uh, also uh, got in a way what they wanted. It happened through the um, easement regulations in the integration of asylum seekers. So there has been a change uh, in the integration law, the asylum seekers were not able to work and through these um, easements, um, they, they, uh, they, they are now eligible for integration program, which means they can uh, join to language classes and work permits, but not all of them. It leads to another uh, phenomenon of the uh, new migration asylum politics. I mean, it was already certificated, but being see more certification. It applies only to asylum seekers with good prospects. So there has been a new administrative category, Bleibe uh, Perspective in German. So uh, asylum seekers with good prospects of staying uh, can enjoy this integration program, can go to work, can uh, get uh, German language classes, and um, maybe shortly, what does it mean, this um, prospect of staying? It means um, asylum seekers, a good uh, prospect of staying, asylum seekers from a country with a high recognition rate or for whom a resilient outlook uh, for the asylum application to be successful. So it is based on nationality. And currently, these are people from uh, Syria, Iran, Iraq, Eritrea, and Somalia. And the other asylum seekers are uh, excluded from these uh, programs. Um, and, and maybe also important, uh, there has been another um, new law. This is the new labor immigration law. It also happened just before the uh, pandemic started. I guess it was in March to, uh, 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 this year. And uh, according to this new uh, labor immigration law, um, the, now the skilled workers who uh, have a vocational training certificate can also, uh, can also migrate to Germany. So um, it was not the case uh, since uh, the guest worker program, only the uh, uh, high skilled workers who had a, who had a univers university degree could uh, migrate to work in Germany. Now there is this also a uh, new uh, labor immigration law. And these are, uh, these happened uh, through this uh, pro migration neoliberal um, um, pressure on uh, the politics. Um. There are like, uh, many problems, of course, coming from these reforms, uh, but I'm going to cut it short and maybe uh, summarize this post-2015 policy changes. It meant, uh, on the one hand, further dismantling of the asylum system, tightening of the asylum system, the stratification of refugees according to their countries of origin, and on the other hand, opening the country for labor migrants. And, uh, thinking uh, asylum seekers also in an, um, in an economic utility sense, which 
draws it away from the humanitarian protection. Okay, I, I would I would like to move to the local perspective and then to the media. Uh, I know we have some some longer opening statements here. That's okay because we're looking really at, at several years uh, of policy. Um, Christiane Beckmann, uh, just to round out uh, the descent from Europe through Germany to the local scene, um, tell us a little bit more about Moabit Hilft, about Moabit Helps, uh, that came about just a few years ago, perhaps also in this context, and what the local experience has been. Is there some way you can summarize some of the essential experiences for us? Yes, thanks for having me here today. Uh, Moabit Hilf started as a neighborhood initiative, and um, we, um, in 2015, when there was the high number of people refugeeing to Germany or to Europe, I don't want to use the terms flood or waves, because by our opinions, human beings cannot be floods or waves which is also a big problem, the rhetoric of the media, of politicians, which is also causing that movement to the right parties more. Um, I would like to look at the people as human, as uh, they are human beings and they are people looking for support, for help, for freedom, for solution, for safety. Um, in 2015, we had about, um, 600 people refugeeing to Berlin. That was not a situation we couldn't be aware of because we had the first dead bodies in 2013 on Lampedusa. We had the experience from the 90s from the Balkan. We had um, all those years we had didn't we haven't been aware and prepared that something like this could happen again. Um, Europe didn't react to the Arabic Spring because that was when it started. Um, in 2014, the former mayor in Berlin said we have to build more accommodations for refugees, but nothing happened. And then we had the beginning in 2014, but the big number of people refugeeing was 2015. And not to forget that the people which reach us are the people which can afford to refuge. Um, the most other people, they cannot afford coming this long way because it's very, very expensive to refuge. And it was cheaper in 2015 like it is today because the borders are much, much higher than it was during that time. Um, in 2015, um, we helped um, refugees since 2013, like, they are part of our neighborhood. If there is a place where just refugees live, what we don't like because we think people don't need, can't be separated and we have to live together, that people can arrive. We also don't use the term integration. We need to give people the possibility to be part of our community and we share, we exchange. Um, and um, since the, we had experiences, we supported people going to the authorities. Um, we've been, um, we saw the situation in front of the Lageso. The Lageso was, uh, is the Landesamt für Gesundheit und Soziales. That is, was the place where the people had to get registered first before they can apply for asylum, because this is something different. The Lageso today has a different name. It's called LAF. Um, the Lageso is uh, from the um, from the city from Berlin. Um, applying for asylum is federal state. So um, in front of this building where the people had to register, we had 1,500 people a day in 40 Celsius waiting for getting registered. Um, we had people, they just arrived, they had no food, they had no water, they had no diaper, they had no soap, they had nothing. They had uh, still untreated torture wounds. I met a woman with two shut wounds and there was no doctor, there was no nurse, nobody. And the location of the Lageso is a kilometer away from the chancellor's office. So we are talking about downtown Berlin. Um, and this situation there was so shocking for so many people and especially for us that we just called out to the citizens in, in Berlin and said, people come, we need to support. And everybody who came there realized 
that there is something else happening in this world than our tiny bubble we are living in. And I think this is what um, what it gave the energy to come and support because it you cannot say that the people which came um they come from a different certain party or they've been from a certain age level or a certain um i, I don't know degree it was everybody came there was this old lady um this totally pierced and tattooed person left um, very conservative because everybody came there for humanity that was what everybody combined and um, why people came in support um, us as organization. We are not a help organization. We are a political organization. We need to help in the first step, but we believe that we have to solve a problem. So I can give somebody food because the person is hungry, but I also have to ask, why are you hungry? Because if not, I will continue feeding without solving any problem. And this is what we did in 15 and what we are still doing. And by my opinion, um, it was important that Merkel said we we um, we are shaking us. We will do this, but I don't think that that was on human humanitarian ground. I think that was more administrative um, uh, meaning because there was not a lot of support by government. It was that. We had nights, we had to find shelter for 200 people, but the senator called us and said, I don't have shelter. Can you do something? So we called people, we had lists, we, um, people slept in dancing schools. So, um, and from step to step that the people get registered, can get registered, which took by that time four to six weeks. So the people have been hanging in a gap in between nowhere for four to six weeks. Um, from the beginning, it was that we had demands. So the first step was people need food. So the authorities had to decide who pays for the food. So they decided who pays for the food. We did it. Um, the next step was there must be a safe safe spaces for the people when they have to wait for four weeks. They have to be a support for children. There has, has to be somebody waiting at night. You have to open at night because people arrive from refugee also at night. They are single traveling children. They can't live in the street. Somebody has to go there. Everything was covered by civilists. Everything was covered by the people from Berlin. And I don't want to use the term Germans because not everybody in Berlin is German. Um, everybody came together and worked together. That was the situation to 15. Thank you. I, I think what you described is an excellent illustration of this adage, where you stand depends on where you sit. Uh, that is, your perspective is very much focused on the local uh, emergency that was faced, uh, and particularly also your description of the relationship with authorities here in Berlin who simply came to citizen initiatives to help out, okay? I want to turn now to Professor Ludenborg uh, and to the media perspective, because we know that the average person in society gets his or her information uh, through the media, whether that be print media or television or increase, increasingly also the social media. And you have been tracking this issue uh, in recent years. Um, what is your perspective on, on the role of the media and the discourse that has unfolded about these issues? We already heard questions about, you know, do we use the word crisis? Do we use the word waves and floods and, and so on? Uh, give us your perspective, because you, you are attuned also to the emotional dimension of discourse uh, as it unfolds in the media. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you for having me and thanks for having the chance to respond to the others, because I think all the three perspectives we've heard about until now have, well, are deeply entangled with media. So all kind of European politics, I think all of us only know by the media. So news media cover the newest decision making or failure of decision making. Uh, that's the way we are informed about that. But knowledge about um, uh, how how to support people, how to um, give 
aid to those who need it. So all these very hyper local activities are deeply organized via media themselves as well. So I know that Moabit Hilft and others um, used apps or used, uh, of course, digital networks to organize their help. And the way we are aware of shifts and changes in politics in Germany, of course, rely heavily on media as well. So I think even in our discourse right now, we could see how media using well metaphors like flat having these images seen how media influence all of us very deeply so the the way we think about migration the way we think about forced migration is deeply based on visuals on narratives we have all learned about uh, via the media so i do research on media migration for long time perspective so we do have a long tradition in germany of having migrants coming there as working migrants at the very beginning and uh, in communication studies we try to follow up that so what do we know about the way media which means legacy media the news media cover migration issues um, we can see a very long tradition that migration is covered mostly with a negative bias so migrants causing problems um, uh, migrants pushing into society and being some kind of imagined threat to our uh, wealth, to our uh, social security system, to maybe even the labor market. So the way, the, the moments when media migration becomes an, a topic in the media is either in context of threat, criminal issues, uh, threat to the labor market, threat to the economic system, um, if we distinguish men and women, we can see when uh, media cover women migrants, it's more about uh, the topic of, well, they need to have some care, they need to have some help. So they are more the, the passive actors who need the German institutions to give them support, partly even support uh, within their own community as when we look at well, uh, threats against women or the, 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 the German perspective that uh, the, the uh, equal rights for men and women are fantastically prepared in Germany, but not in other countries. So focusing on these inequalities is a, is a very traditional media topic there. Uh, so what we saw in this uh, summer of of uh, welcome culture um, was a shift at the very beginning. So this, uh, all of you mentioned that this, um, well, open arms, welcoming Germany, being proud of being that open country at that very moment was in a way celebrated in the media as well for a short period of time. So this very moment when um, the, the forced refugees came by feet and then by bus um, from um, Hungary um, via Austria to Germany, um, we saw these well celebration of welcoming cultures, but it was well quite short period of time. It was already in uh, in in the autumn when it started to shift, and we had this uh, I would call it a kind of media event. This New Year's Eve in Cologne was produced as a media event, as a shifting point where this threatening Muslim young man offending our white German uh, women by their bodies, this uh, really uh, produced a turning point. And all these uh, shifts and articulations are deeply based in, uh, in, in the way media um, produce these images, pr produce these uh, rhetoric, produce narratives um, where this uh, narrative of solidarity, of the need for help, of an open country existed for a period of time, but then uh, was pushed back uh, towards um, well, this more rational reflection. Uh, other European countries need to uh, go in front, so Germany can't manage that on its own. So we do have these very personal individual stories. You showed the visual of uh, the young boy, dad at the beach. Uh, there has been a strong ethical discourse on that. Still, I think it is um, 
it has to be considered whether it's really uh, necessary and, and, and useful to show this visual as um, well. It's 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 a horrible thing for uh, his parents. Of course, for the boy who doesn't live anymore. So what what do we do when circulating these visuals? So these single stories telling uh, telling the 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 um, uh, the course of of um, refuge and the course while crossing the Mediterranean Sea have been told as well. Um, but what we saw, and these were the very first images we saw here, uh, we did analysis of some visuals there, uh, was a, a mass of bodies uh, in a very small boat um, being too much. Uh, so we saw the perspective, the photographers traditionally had the perspective of either uh, the security staff uh, waiting for them or um, the police people waiting for them. So looking uh, from a distance to them and not showing uh, single human beings, but showing a mass of bodies coming there. And these images, and we, we know this, rhetoric of the boat being full already has been established in the early 90s. Uh, you told that story of, of higher number of, of refugees down in Germany as well. So it was um, Der Spiegel, um, a very well reputed news magazine in Germany, uh, which used this image already in the early 90s as a cover um, uh, visual. Uh, the, the, um, the German boat being too full and no not having enough space for others coming there. So we know that media are intensely not just um, well reflecting images and 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 terms that are produced in politics, but produce them their, themselves. And as you mentioned, we are now analyzing uh, the emotional connotation of these. So these. Um, um, emotions of, of fear, of threat are heavily produced, but as we have heard just before, um, based in an, an intense engagement of civil society members, uh, emotions of solidarity, of support, um, are circulating in digital media as well. And we have some international research on, on that as well, that this notion of solidarity is intensely circulating uh, via, via social media. But we do have a, a strong polarization there, having these contrasting emotional connotations of discourse. Thank you very, very much uh, for this overview of, of the media perspective. Now, there is, in what you presented, uh, the observation that there is this, and also the others presented this very much, this undercurrent of the sense of threat or, or challenge that's posed by the alien, the different person that comes in, and so on. Um, that was already happening, and that is an older issue that has been around for a while. And it c came face to face with a pandemic this year with the situation of uh, a public health crisis where there's a defensive, perhaps nationally oriented reaction to want to close off borders, of course, no travel even for one's own citizens, lockdowns and, and so on. And that starts to interact with this question of migration. And so I would like to start with the Berlin perspective, then go through the Germany perspective with Duigo, and then back to Europe, and then I'll come back to you, Professor Ludenborg. Um, so let's start with Christiane Beckmann. How has the migration issue for Moabit Hilft, and just generally in Berlin, in your perception, played out this year in the context of a public health crisis like this pandemic? What has that added to the mix of, of issues uh, that you've had to confront with the organization and in your daily work? Um, I think um, Corona has ex exposed lots of legs in basic infrastructure, and especially for refugees. Um, we, we, we have to remember that there is a lack of language, there is a lack of being part of community, so there is a lot of isolation. And um, and it is it is uh, difficult on on every level. If you have it um, in in the Kita, 
you have the kids at home, the parents maybe don't speak um, enough German, um, so the kids lose the touch for the German language. A lot of kids, they had to stay at home for four weeks, for eight, for eight weeks, they start losing the language again. Um, with school, there is a big gap because children live maybe in an apartment with the parents, then they are isolated. Maybe they live in one of the camps in Berlin and we have more than a hundred um, where they have maybe support for social workers or they have live in a camp, six people in one room. They don't have the internet access. They don't have the equipment. So how are they doing the homeschooling? There is no support for the, from the uh, parents for the children because the German is definitely not enough for do homeschooling. Um, we have the, um, the work part, the unemployment, or they lose the, um, the, the Ausbildung, the vocational trainings. Also vocational trainings is important in asylum processes for people with the Duldung. They cannot lose this because that could cause the lose of um, staying in Germany. Um, the German classes, they close. People don't have access to internet, so they can't work on their German skills. They lose the German skills. They sit at home with the family. They maybe just speak Dari or Farsi or whatever language. So they lose this again. Um, so it's it's on so many levels. We have um, homeless refugees because they went in the uh, undercover. They went. Uh, they are illegal because they don't have the access to know their rights. So you can't get a grip on those people. We have to close, and um, we are one of the few um, organizations in Berlin which have an open house. You don't have to make an appointment, which is for a lot of people another step to take. Make an appointment if you can just go somewhere. It's usually it's much easier. So we have to close now. It's the second time we know. It's the third time now that we close. Um, people don't have access to the organizations because they have to accept their paperwork for the job center or for the lab. Um, they can't have the access to the um, internet um, because also the from the Ausländerbehörde or other pages, they are not in enough languages. So it's just maybe in German and English, but there's no Farsi, Dari or Arabic. They don't know where to go, who to call. It's very, very difficult for the people. Very difficult. Okay. Now, in terms of of the civil society aspect, um, is that an aspect that's under pressure because of the pandemic? Is it more difficult to get volunteers because people are staying at home? They don't want to get engaged, involved. Uh, how has the civil society dimension of it? Uh, in terms of the, you know, the Berlin population, German and non-German, helping out, how has that been impacted by the pandemic for you in in your everyday work? I mean, if you I compare it to two fifteen, it's it's to a totally different situation because in this situation, every company was open-minded and said, okay, take vacation. So now we are more in this. There's not this emotional wave that everybody wants to help. Now we are more in this realistic level that somebody, if I have time, I go and support. And right now, with the pandemic, I must say, I'm very surprised that I get a lot of calls because people cannot go to work or they have to do um, um, the, the students, they work from home, they can manage their time management totally different. And I have, I would say there is no difference. It's more that I have to say, I'm sorry, maybe January, February, because we cannot be too many people because it's too dangerous because of the coronavirus. It's more the opposite. No, no. Okay. Now, Durgo, uh, the the national German perspective, uh, again, we've already seen the building up of these two perspectives, the more uh, positive and the more negative, you know, uh, facing one another. How has the pandemic interacted with the question of migration as you observe it in the overall national German scene, the German perspective? Oh. Well, the, maybe to start with, the appeal of the government to stay at home um, sounds very privileged when we think it, of it from the perspective of migration, uh, because these questions emerge, what is when my home is not safe, or what is when I have to go to my 
systematically important but precarious and badly paid job and doesn't have the luxury to stay at home and do uh, home office. And it becomes clear to be able to stay at home and that your home is safe is a very class race, gender based privilege. And if you look at the situation um, through, through this pandemic, the already existing inequalities and uh, the problems uh, uh, in this migration politics become visible and also uh, sharpened. And um, uh, one of the first things we saw about the living conditions in the large scale shared accommodations uh, of refugees, for instance, this became also visible. Um, as also Christina uh, told, these accommodations do um, not only lack sufficient space to practice social distancing or to follow the hygiene rules, but also have been very problematic because of the living conditions and the violence that refugees uh, have to experience. Especially women um, refugee organizations uh, have been fighting for a long time uh, for the abolition of these uh, shelters. As the COVID-19 outbreaks uh, started in these shelters, um, the measures taken uh, were not national measures. They were mostly uh, taken uh, um, individually, and it was mostly about quarantining the whole shelter. So when there was one case detected, 500 people were suddenly in a quarantine. And it's limited to the, the freedom of residents and it limited their access to legal consultation for their asylum claim or to mental health services or to education. And um, although no national measure has been taken regarding this su subject, these scandals moved also the political agenda in some cases. For instance, in the city of Pos Potsdam, it's a close city to Berlin. Uh, they passed an agreement to gradually abolish shared accommodations uh, for refugees and asylum seekers. And if you look at the deportations, um, at the beginning of the pandemic, these were suspended. However, it began it again at the end of May already. And uh, the Dublin case deportations to other European countries uh, start again in July. And um, if you look at the political actors in the last integration summit in October this year, um, these uh, political actors, including our chancellor, uh, accepted that especially migrants have been particularly badly affected uh, uh, from this corona crisis. On the one hand, language courses, consultation and other integration offers have been cancelled during the first lockdown. And now they are trying to uh, make uh, digital. On the other hand, because the migrants work in jobs in which they have a high risk to get infected, or in jobs they have a high risk to lose their jobs in such a crisis. So, the solution offered during this summit uh, was um, mostly about the digitalization of German language courses and uh, consultation services. However, this solution doesn't resolve the structural inequality that underlies the problem. So the question, why are migrants and refugees particularly badly affected by the pandemic in Germany? Because they are the group which suffer from structural inequality and racism, but also existed before the pandemic, but became more visible and sharpened through the pandemic because they work in disproportionately in precarious jobs. They have unequal access to education, housing market, and health services. And we see this also clearly when we look at the migrant labor through this pandemic, migrant labor and the precarious and exploitative conditions became more visible. Um, it became visible that there's a high percent of migrants workers in the systematically important jobs. So jobs that keep the infrastructure going but whose working conditions are very precarious and exploited. So there were two scandals. One, uh, there were many scandals, but um, which I'm going to mention. The first one is, was about the uh, harvesting season of uh, asparagus. It was at the beginning of the pandemic. Asparagus is the German's favorite vegetable. So as the migrant workers from East Europe couldn't come because of the closed borders, first suggestion of the Minister of Agriculture was to 
mobilize asylum seekers to harvest asparagus. As this appeal was faced with a critic because to use a group of people who are normally not allowed to work in order to harvest asparagus is pure exploitation. So the government organized charter flights to bring the migrants work workers from Eastern Europe to harvest asparagus. So their, their precarious working and living conditions have been also visible for a while during this period. Um, and then the, the other scandal was about uh, the meat plant workers. They also made the headlines, their situation after uh, COVID-19 outbreaks uh, took place in meat slaughter, processing houses, and um, in this uh, meat industry, uh, there's a high percent of migrant workers uh, from Eastern Europe who work in um, precarious employment conditions, uh, like through subcontractors and so on. So, um, what is positive there in uh, already in May uh, 2020, the government started to talk about a legislative initiative against outsourcing and subcontractors in the meat plant industry. So, although this uh, draft uh, legislation um, has lost some important aspects, um, it is still um, going to take place and um the um, meat plant industry uh, to a certain part uh, will not be able to uh have subcontractors so it is a step for a better and uh working conditions uh for the meat plant um, uh, workers okay so, yeah okay Nicolas von Peter, we come back to the broader European perspective with you. Um, migration, the question of refugees, is still a live agenda item. Uh, there may be fewer coming, but there are still some coming. The pandemic is something that countries are very much grappling with on a national basis. Uh, there are some attempts to come up with a, a European response, also in this public health field. Um, what is the the current state in the European Union when it comes to the intersection of these two issues? Uh, we we hear how this is happening locally. We hear how this is intersecting on the national level in Germany. Where do you observe the intersection of these two issues on the European level, in European councils and so on? That's a very good question. <laughs> Um, I think that um, we have indeed uh, a European. Uh, we, we we have we see uh, that Europe as a whole is affected, not country by country, but Europe as a whole is challenged. Um, we've seen this in particular in the first response that member states uh, took when faced with an unprecedented situation. And we, as a Commission, we uh, already in, in January we had we had proposed the first measures, and and we were 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 in, in fact better prepared than many member states but um as 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 it went then i mean the way member states reacted was in a way understandable because um some of them were not prepared and and they didn't listen to what the commission was already saying to them in, in general to be very frank um but i think we after the first shock which uh, which basically expressed uh, uh, which was the uh, effect of member states um, closing their borders, member states thinking in the first place of themselves, um, not sharing uh, medical equipment um, um, and, and, and some other cases which were a bit deplorable and regrettable. I think we then went to a more coordinated approach uh, where the Commission played a, a, a facilitated role and, and a role to coordinate different uh, different measures at, at European level. and, and um, uh, to be very honest, I have not thought about the intersection yet between the two issues, because uh, the impact of the uh, of the pandemic on uh, on migrants is felt mostly at the at the national and, and at the local level. So, what uh, Hugo Gürsel said and Christiane Beckmann is what we very much ob uh, observe uh, throughout Europe uh, at at the local level, in particular where people have to live. So uh, I can uh, I, I can confirm that also in Greece. Uh, in the hotspots where um, situations are the most difficult for refugees because these places are the most cramped, the most uh, populated. We had the same issues uh, and we still have them as we have them in, in Germany, which means that if one person uh, is sick, everyone goes to the quarantine. Um, 
and and so in a way, uh, as uh, Ms. Gersel already explained, uh, the, the the pandemic is exposing, is making patent visible structural problems which were really there before, uh, and and it just puts the finger on them and and shows us that uh, in a situation where there's a particular strain um, on 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 administration, um, uh, I mean things become crystal clear, and and so. From that perspective, uh, the, the pandemic hasn't hasn't uh, brought so many new uh, uh, things to to uh, I mean hasn't in, in a negative sense. We already had the deficiencies before. On the positive side, uh, uh, there are also in the area of asylum migration, you have uh, you have effects of a digitalization, which is uh, probably the most positive effect uh, uh, of the pandemic uh, throughout society. Um, and we all know we are now we are now practicing digitalization, and 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 there are also examples in the field of asylum migration where digital means have improved situations. Um, Ms. Guzla has just mentioned more negative examples, which which uh, is which is fully justified. If people have less access to uh, certain resources, or if they could have access to digital resources, they don't have the access to. I mean, to online classes, for instance, they don't have the access to the actual. To the network, you know, um, which is a, a clear sign of, of of digital divide, but in in, in other areas uh, uh, or in other cases, uh, um, asylum seekers profited and still profiting from digitalization. For instance, in Greece, uh, the government has started to allow uh, uh, applicants to 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 to, uh, to lodge their applications online and to um, to let them check the status. Uh, of the application online, there's a, there's more transparency to the digitalization and more convenience. It's just a matter then of making this resource available to everyone. And uh, um, but but there's a lot of potential there. Um, okay. the, the second effect is also um, interesting. It's completely unrelated. But I, while I was listening, I was putting it on paper. Is uh, the effect of uh, the lack of physical meetings. This time it's a negative one, uh, negative effect. Uh, I, I mentioned the difficulty of finding an agreement on asylum and migration law at the European level, and and we have seen over the last month the negotiations about the new proposal from the Commission, the the new package uh, from September, has been um, ha the, the, the negotiations have been impaired by the uh, impossibility to meet physically. So there's a very slow progress. And, and some put this down to the uh, lack of physical meetings that, for instance, ministers couldn't meet very often uh, uh, physically and something so difficult and so sensitive as the uh, um, as, as, an, as a European asylum and immigration policy is often only uh, possible to move forward if you have these have these one to one meetings if uh, if in a council people can meet in the margins, which means outside the regular hours. And can have chats in small groups and can uh, can try to move things forward informally. That's an interesting effect of the pandemic as well. That that the real policy, uh, I mean, that the most difficult, uh, intricate policy questions, are at the moment difficult to solve um, uh, because of the um, uh, of the pandemic. Okay. Okay. Let me. We are uh, first with Professor Lunenborg, and immediately also going into our final round of comments. Um, and I will ask each of you, uh, if you look at your watches, you see what time it is, to be concise. So we have had longer statements. That's not possible in this last round. I first want to go back to uh, Professor Lunenborg so that she can say something from the media point of view about this year of migration intersecting with the pandemic uh, and combine that because that is my closing question to all four of you. Um, the outlook, no one has a crystal ball, no one knows how long this pandemic will still uh, last, but what it is from your particular perspective that concerns you the most for the year 2021? What concerns you the most and where you have the most hope? 
And unfortunately, I have to ask you to be in both areas quite concise. Professor Lunenbach, we go to you first. Yeah, it will be short. Just as a comment to Nicolas, uh, we can see right now that Ursula von der Leyen and Boris Johnson are able to meet and to meet quite often. So it seems to depend on what uh, is on which kind of pressure whether real meetings are made available. So focusing the media perspective, I can really make it short. We see with Corona a single issue public and we see this single issue public for months now. Normally we do have a news cycle of around two weeks uh, having an um, issue coming up and being discussed heavily and then fading out of the news. And now Corona for, well, I think in, in during summer it has shifted a little bit, but for months now it's the very, very top topic. And all other events are well fading out of public reflection. So I think uh, the fire in Muria was to all of us this horrible event where out of sudden for a short moment everybody was looking out there and uh, in a way well shocked by all the details to be seen there but they are still there but media doesn't look at them that intensely thus corona of course pushes all the other topics at the periphery to look into the future, of course, well, I'm not sure whether 2021 will already be the fundamental shift. Of course, my worry is a very basic economic one, um, as we are aware of the money that is spent in Germany, that is spent in Europe, but that is spent worldwide as well to somehow, while well, dealing with this crisis. Uh, I think there are already prognoses of the the kind of um, well poverty that will come up out as an effect out of that. So in a global perspective, migration will increase, will increase heavily as inequalities between countries, between um, uh, well uh, even regions of the world will become stronger, and um, the, the all the economic power which is not invested in producing well even food for people worldwide of course will cause migration thus I think on a longer run we will see this forced mobility even in a in a more intense effect and in terms of media questions um, I think uh, in a way, we are all well uh, bored out of only discussing uh, Corona issues, but nevertheless, of course, we are touched about it. This will change, but I think the national pressure on how do we deal with this national crisis out of the Corona crisis will will uh, be on the very top of the news agenda and other topics being in the periphery more. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Christiane Beckmann, a closing thought from you, from the local scene. Um, it is difficult to stay just local because um, pe people or refugees here in Berlin ha have um, separated families and they have a lot of family members on Chios and in Bulgaria, in Hungary, in wherever. And it seems that those, the family reunions or the possibility of those coming back together is, it seems to be get further and further and further away, which makes it very difficult for them to arrive here without the other family members. Um, I hope that uh, processes which improve because there are some things they changed because it is digitalized that they don't go back to the disadvantage of the refugees and I have the feeling that sometimes it's also Corona is also used to dehumanize um, refugees because we have different regulations they uh, they have quarantines and camps we are just maybe quarantined in our 60 square meter apartments and um i think for the future upcoming because i think corona will be a part of our life probably for the entire next year it will be more and more difficult okay thank you do you go your final thoughts Okay, um, what, what I worry about is um, a new formation of populism, including different groups spreading conspiracy theories about Corona and demonstrating against the measures and 
after the danger is gone and the measures are lifted, I afraid this group can change their focus uh, against migration since there are already right wing groups involved in it. But from my perspective, the post pandemic future can be also um, made optimistic. For instance, through the corona crisis, we saw that certain things are possible as long as political will is there, like certain regulations against the poor working conditions of uh, migrant workers. And I think it's it's up to us how we shape the post-pandemic future. Will we ignore the all inequalities which became visible through the corona crisis? Or are we going to insist on fighting them uh, for an equal and just society? Okay. And a closing word from the EU from Brussels, although sitting in Berlin. <laughs> yeah, it's just me, not the EU. <laughs> um, yes, I, I think I, I'm, I share with the worries that goes um, that do you um, express that, um, but differently that that the there may be uh, the economic effects of the crisis will, will still kick in or are yet to kick in, and and we know that an economic downturn and 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 worsening of of, of, of personal situation of people. Is unfortunately often also have an impact on their political, uh, on their political positions and their openness towards others. So uh, from from the Brussels perspective, uh, 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 hardened um, uh, opinion towards migration in Germany would make it much more difficult to close uh, a deal, to come to an agreement, which is in our view uh, should not be only effective but also as humanitarian as possible. And for this, we need people to be open towards migration still. And, and my hope is that this uh, agreement will, will be possible, uh, uh, perhaps at the end of next year, uh, and, and uh, uh, perhaps also thanks to what the crisis has has basically done with every, every one of us. We have uh, have to had we had to be a, uh, empathetic and and to to look at things differently. We've all been shaken a little bit. Uh, we are now doing something a bit different than we did perhaps a year ago. We we have new practices. We are, we know uh, we know new things and. This has perhaps stimulated our imagination, and more imagination is always good for empathy and for understanding other people's needs. And and yes, and that's my hope that the crisis will perhaps worsen people's situation, but will uh, have uh, uh, and stimulated their imagination and 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 their uh, and the ability to put themselves into other people's uh, shoes. Okay, that's a very hopeful perspective. Uh, we're not quite ending with that because one of the things, of course, we have not had is the voice of those fleeing of refugees and we are going to close with a brief uh, five minute film uh, from a poetry slam uh, where uh, i will say some concluding things after we've seen this hinter uns mein land alles was ich bin wurde dort geboren alles was mir heimat war der bolzplatz wo wir als kinder spielten das Lächeln meiner ersten Liebe, der Apfelbaum bei uns im Park und der kleine See hinterm Berg versteckt. Der heiße Tee auf dem Blechtablett, faltige Geschichtenerzähler, Lachfalten zieren ihre Gesichter, Quatsch machen auf dem Rückweg von der Schule nach Haus. Nachts warten, bis die Eltern schlafen und dann wieder raus. Das quietschende Fahrrad meines Bruders, die Gedichte Nerudas und der Geruch von nassem Rasen. Radios, die gequälte Töne, trotzdem wie Melodien raustragen. Das Singen meiner Schwester am Morgen. Meine Mutter. Meine Mutter mit ihren ständigen Geldsorgen. Und ich weiß nicht warum, Marienkäfer. All das war mir Heimat. All das war mir einst Heimat. Aber ich konnte nicht mehr bleiben. Hinter uns der Krieg, das frische Grab meiner Eltern. Der letzte Erdkuben rollt noch ab, hat seinen festen Platz noch nicht gefunden. So frisch ist meine Trauer. Und nix ist verarbeitet. Ich konnte nicht mehr bleiben. Man sprach von uns als den Tod geweihten. Unsere Leute in Züge gezwungen, die im Rauch der Loks dahingleiten. Unsere Türen zertrümmert, Schaufenster in Scherben. Unsere Eltern verängstigt, Geschwister geschunden. Und grausame Nachrichten von Freunden. Denen, die noch da waren. Die meisten waren verschwunden. Man konnte nicht mehr bleiben. Keinen weiteren Tag mehr. Der nächste Schritt in meiner Stadt ist der letzte Schritt in meinem Land und der schlimmste Schritt dann auf dieses rostige Boot. Was wanken wird zunächst, uns halten wird zunächst und dann wird es sinken, uns dem Meer übergeben. Im Meer so trostlos, der Mond versteckt sich hinter den Wolken, 
die Nacht so dunkel, du siehst nichts. Stundenlang nichts. Und wenn ich im Dunkeln die Augen schließe, höre ich meine Mutters Stimme. Um uns her ist nur das Meer, als wäre unser Boot das Herz aller Dinge. Ich öffne die Augen und blicke Richtung Himmel. Gebete sind unsere Segel. Rettungswesten werden den Rest übernehmen. Nur die Hoffnung können sie nicht tragen. Ein Mann schwimmt auf mich zu. Hier, nimm du. Ich schaffe es nicht mehr. Ein Jahr ist er alt. Und wer ist sein Name? Der Vater gleitet aus der Weste ins ewig Dunkelblaue. So wurde ich das erste Mal Vater. Im Meer also. Per Übergabe also. Der Mann aus der Weste gab mir sein Erbgut als Erbe. Im Exil angekommen, habe ich schnell gemerkt, die wichtigsten Wörter sind Aufenthaltsgenehmigung, Entschuldigung und Danke. Im Exil angekommen, sah ich eine Familie nach langer Zeit vereint, wie der Vater vor Glück wimmert, still und aus tiefsten Innern, mit all der Scham eines Menschen, der selten weint. Ich folgte der Familie Schritt für Schritt, aber nur mit meinem Blick. Im Exil angekommen, aber die Heimatserde nimmt man an den Fußsohlen mit. Denn ich bin von dort und ich habe Erinnerungen. Ich bin geboren, wie die Menschen geboren werden. Ich habe eine Mutter, die mich liebt. Und es bricht mir das Herz. In den Briefen, die sie schrieb, sehe ich, wie ihre Hand inzwischen zittert. Wenn ich nun Heimweh sage, sage ich Traum. Denn die alte Heimat gibt es kaum. Und bleiben wir hier, werden wir wie der Strand, nicht ganz mehr nicht ganz Land und bleiben wir hier, werden wir wieder Strand. Nicht ganz Meer, nicht ganz Land. Im Exil angekommen heißt mich ein Herr willkommen. Das andere Herr ist mir fremde Fahnen. Manchmal spürt man die Liebe, manchmal spürt man den Hass. Dir schauen sie aufs Kopftuch, mir in den Pass. Aber sei ihnen nicht böse, Habibi, vergib ihnen. Sie vergaßen die Liebe, sie vergaßen die Bibel. Wünsch ihnen den Frieden. Im Gegenteil, zeig's ihnen. Wir sind Stehaufmenschen, reiß uns die Beine weg und wir gehen auf Händen. Reiß uns die Beine weg und wir gehen auf Händen. Machen das Beste aus unserem Leben, bis unsere Leben enden. Und wer weiß, vielleicht kehre ich eines Tages heim und es wird nicht alles verwandelt sein. Vielleicht sehe ich unseren alten Apfelbaum oder den Bolzplatz hinter rostbraunem Zaun. Und ich umarme meine Geschwister und ich küsse meine Mutter. Und das Glück beißt seinen kleinen Zahn in mein Herz. Mein Name ist Ahmed Yusuf, Vater von Basim, und ich bin Flüchtling. Ich bin aus Syrien geflohen. Mein Name ist Daniel Levi und ich bin Flüchtling. Ich bin aus Deutschland geflohen. Das Jahr ist 2015. Das Jahr ist 1938. hard to comment on something like this. It should stand by itself, something to watch again and again, a very powerful set of voices. Uh, I want to thank our panelists for having joined us tonight for this conversation about migration, about the pandemic, about the difficult intersection also of these issues from the point of view of the European Union, the local Berlin scene, German national policy, and also the media perspective. I want to thank our audience that has joined us. We will post this recording on our YouTube channel, and we're going to show you a final couple of slides with information uh, as we are looking towards our uh, next sessions that are coming up in the new year. Um, you will be able to join us again February 18th, Sustainability from Buzzword to Guiding Principle. Um, April 15th, the Digital Revolution, Opportunities, Challenges and Implications. And on June 17th, Young Globalization, Role and Impact of Young Leaders in a Post-National World. Those are the three sessions we have planned uh, for this coming year for the first half. And then we will have three more for the second half of the year. With that, we come to the end of today's broadcast. I thank you, the audience. I thank the panel members again. I wish everyone happy holidays, good health, and we hope to see you at our next session uh, when the new year starts. Thank you. 
and goodbye.